related. If you, uh, uh, you have to uh, assign for your presence, so in the reception, there is some uh, QR code that you can uh, assign for your presence there, right? Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning everyone, and uh, <coughs> let's start the uh, plenary session today. And uh, <coughs> today's uh, lecturer is uh, Professor Maria Dombera Piancastelli, and uh, I'm uh, Nobuhiro Kosugi, and uh, I'm very much pleased to chair this session. And uh, Maria Dombera is a uh, Professor Emeritus of the Sorbonne University in Paris, and also she was a professor of the uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. And she, now uh, she has uh, returned to the Rome, and she received the PhD in 1976, and uh, <coughs> she's a uh, uh, she has been uh, working for the atomic and molecular spectroscopy and the dynamics by using a synchrotron radiation and uh, FEL. Okay, let's start, please. <clears throat> okay. So, good morning everyone, and thank you Nobu for the kind introduction, and thank you very much to Arnaldo and Tulio for this kind invitation and for taking care of every small detail. And you know, uh, to uh, be invited to give a plenary lecture to an important conference like VOVX is like receiving the Academy Award for a movie star, the Oscar. So, I'm really gratified. Actually, there are two types of Academy Awards. One is for some brilliant recent activity, and the other one is called a Lifelong Achievement, which means you, you had a decent career, but it's over. So, I don't know how it works in my case, but I'm really, really happy to be here anyway. So, I will discuss uh, dynamics of water. And I'll spare you the usual couple of sentences that we put for our funding agencies to explain why it's important to work, to work with water, because we all are very aware of that. So, um, I will present a series of different results over uh, a long stretch of time. So, basically, I will discuss uh, polarization and relaxation dynamics after a uh, core excitation or core ionization, and in particular, ultra-fast dissociation. 
And then I will discuss briefly double cohorts and finally multiphoron absorption. So uh, let's start. This first paper, it's in fact about 25 years ago. I was in Berlin working with uh, Uwe Becker. And so the first light source is ASI Lab in, in Hamburg. And we were working on this uh, BW3 beamline. Now, if somebody remembers BW3, was, it was called like a second and a half generation facility because we were working on Doris, which was a second generation storage ring, but BW3 was pretty, pretty advanced, so we call it two and a half. And uh, with Uwe Becker's group, we were measuring uh, ion yield, so uh, total ion yield in this case, this example, and then a mass spectrometer, spectro uh, spectrum for one particular photon energy value with the kind of ions we were collecting. And so uh, total departure ion yield, all the important yields here, and some more examples like weaker channels, and we were also able to measure uh, double ion, ion coincidence, triple ion, ion coincidence. So, for instance, you see this obvious effect that uh, there is a strong increase above threshold when you go to higher and higher charges because of the weight of the normal OG decay. So, this is like a general overview of what we could obtain at that time with uh, ion yield. But uh, just uh, want to stress two uh, specific uh, uh, results that we obtained. Of course, uh, if you think of all possible channels after uh, core excitation and core ionization of water, you have all this zoo. So uh, let's just select uh, two particular uh, uh, results. One is this one. So this is total ion yield, and these are the yields for uh, two particular fragments, OH plus and H plus. And you can notice that corresponding to this first resonance, there is a big change in intensity. So uh, the OH plus uh, yield is much higher than the H plus yield. So how uh, we could explain this difference? If you excite to the first resonance, which is the uh, 41 uh, virtual orbital, you, uh, in the decay process, you reach states, like single charge states, which are below the double ionization uh, threshold for valence ionization. If you excite to the second resonance, the 2B2 state, and you follow the decay, you go to states where it's possible to have um, Double charge, the, uh, double charge, which means for the first resonance, the majority of events is from this uh, OH plus plus H neutral uh, ion uh, pair. But if you cross this threshold going to the higher resonance, you can have OH plus plus H plus. So this big difference here in yield is because the partner for the first resonance or OH plus is mainly H neutral. And for the second resonance, it's also H+. Plus. So that was one of the results. The second result is concerns the yield of one particular fragment, which is H2+. Plus. And so, again, this is uh, total yield. This is H2O+. Plus. And you see H2+, plus is produced mostly at the second resonance, but also is not produced at the photon energy which correspond to the top or the resonance in the other ion yield curves or in the total yield, but is produced on this high energy side. And so, uh, what's the explanation for that? You can think of a series of events which leads to the formation of H2+, plus, but one uh, simple path is the direct formation coming from uh, excited vibrational modes. So, if you think of uh, this transition and the excitation of both the bending mode and the uh, stretching mode for the, uh, for the uh, species which is produced, we can uh, reach states in which we have smaller H or H bond um, angle 
and larger OH distance, which means that if these vibrational uh, uh, higher states are reached, we can have the direct approach of the two H species and the direct formation of uh, H2+. Plus. And there were other measurements performed later on at Springgate, and where they showed the same process with vibrational resolution and confirmed this whole story. Okay, so uh, this is my first light source. And let's go to the second light source and discuss ultra-fast dissociation. The second light source is MAX2 in Sweden. Uh, we were working on I-411, and this is a, a photo emission experiment with a hemispherical analyzer. And so, what's, uh, well, just briefly recalling, what is ultra-fast dissociation? Uh, Ultra-fast dissociation means uh, that the breaking of a chemical bond can take place during the core hole lifetime. So the core hole lifetime, in this sense, is used as an internal clock. For oxygen, when it's uh, photoexcitation or photoionization, this clock takes around three or four femtoseconds, which means ultra-fast dissociation can take place in this very short time interval. And uh, if this chemical, a chemical bond is broken uh, during uh, this uh, core hole lifetime, we will have the electronic relaxation will take place in the fragment and not in the intact molecule. And so in the uh, resonant OJ spectrum, we will have the signature of the fragment and the intact molecule uh, features. And the, the, there have been many, many examples on this ultra-fast dissociation processes by the Uppsala group. Let's see how it works with water. So for water, uh, as a function of the uh, OH distance, we start from water in ground state. We promote to this uh, first excitation, which is the 4A1 virtual orbital, which is known to be dissociative. And so we promote our system to uh, a state which is uh, dissociative. And then it can happen that we have early OJ decays in the intact molecule, or if the system has time to evolve, we will have late OJ decay in the fragment. And you can see that in this area, which is the fragment area, the potential curves for the intermediate state and the final state are parallel. But how can we detect ultra-fast fragmentation? We need to have some uh, specific experimental conditions which are called Auger resonant Raman conditions, which basically means that the photon bandwidth has to be narrower than the lifetime broadening of a photoabsorption fissure. And this allows us to scan through a resonant and take several resonant to JDK spectra across the resonance. So in this case, for water, we are talking about this first excited state for a one which is quite broad, and so it's dissociative. And these are the experimental results. So a series of spectra taken on top of the resonance, or since we are under resonant uh, uh, Raman conditions, we can take spectra detuning from the top in the negative or positive direction. So basically what we see he, uh, here, it's a bunch of features which show linear dispersion as a function of photon energy, and a bunch of features which stay a constant kinetic energy. And the dispersion law is very important to actually characterize this ultra-fast dissociation phenomenon because these features here, which uh, correspond to uh, molecular features, are dispersive because if you uh, think of energy conservation, the only dispersion channel for the energy that we put in the first step is the kinetic energy of the uh, photoelectron. So they show linear dispersion. But the fragment lines stay a constant kinetic energy because, as I said, the potential curves are parallel in, in uh, um, that situation, and the extra energy go to the, uh, goes to the nuclear motion. And this is a blow-up of these features. You see, we can characterize two different electronic states for the fragment, and even with a vibrational substructure. And so this is the calculated uh, resonant OJ spectrum for the fragment, and this is the experimental spectrum. So in the experimental spectrum, we, we have some extra features, which are molecular spectator decay features, 
but we can clearly see this uh, um, fragment fissures which are superimposed. And also uh, we have measured H2O and D2O and you can see the spectra are of course very similar but the intensity of these fragment lines is reduced for D2O and this is just because for the same core whole lifetime this uh, nuclear motion uh, is uh, uh, less pronounced for um, D2O. So we also see an isotopic effect. Okay, so another story and another light source. This is Spring Gate. Spring Gate and uh, Beamline 27, which was very important for our community. And again, it's a, um, an experiment with um, um, hemispherical analyzer as the, uh, <coughs> for the um, photoelectrons. Okay, so the subject here is again resonant OJ decay, but in this case, it's resonant OJ decay above the core excited, uh, above the uh, ionization threshold of H2O. Now, as I said, for ultrafast dissociation, there are many, many examples of this phenomenon taking place. Um, below threshold, so for core excited states. But this is one of the few, or maybe the only example, of resonant Auger decay and uh, ultrafast dissociation above uh, uh, photoionization threshold. So, those again are the ion yields for water. And in one particular ion yield, which I will talk more about later, we see that there is a pronounced uh, bump above threshold. So there is some sort of continuum resonance. Now, uh, basically, continuum resonance is above threshold can be categorized in two main groups. One is the so-called shape resonances, which means uh, um, the photoelectron is emitted, then is trapped by a potential barrier and eventually tunnels through the barrier. And so we see some uh, effect in the uh, photoionization cross-section of the main line. The other category of uh, above threshold resonance, continuous resonance, is, is double excited states. So they could, can be neutral states with two exciting electrons, one core valence excitation and one valence valence excitation. And these states are neutral, but they are embedded in the continuum because the total energy is above the ionization threshold. And this is, in fact, the case here. We can have states like uh, uh, core valence uh, vacancy and valence valence excitation. And in this particular case, also the double excited, double excited states of this type are dissociative. So, what we could measure at spring gate was uh, for the photon energy corresponding to this resonant, this resonant OJ spectrum, and you see these uh, peaks here are exactly the same fragment peaks that we have measured below threshold for this. Uh, 41 excitation. So this is really an uh, uh, ultra-fast fragmentation process taking place in the continuum. And I'm not sure that there are m more other examples of this kind of uh, um, processes. Okay, let's move to another source, and, uh, which is the ALS in California. And I was working with Dennis Lindo's group. And uh, the technique we were using was, uh, again, mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry. But the particularity of this experiment is that we were able to collect cations and anions, so positively charged and negatively charged pieces. So we had a magnetic mass spectrometer, and we could switch the polarity and collect positive or negative charges. And we performed a lot of work on many molecules. Uh, one Im important parameter was the possibility with this technique to characterize continuum resonances. But uh, let's see, in, in this particular case, uh, which kind of extra information for water uh, for excitation and decay we can obtain if you look at the anion channel. 
Okay, this is just some uh, uh, cation spectra. So again, total yield, this H2 plus fragment with this shift that I have mentioned before. Some uh, classical examples, which kind of information we can uh, derive from cations, like for instance here, if you look at this series, H2O, OH, O, you see that there is an indefinite increase above threshold because we can, uh, this uh, uh, subsequent fragmentation is more and more prominent if we go above threshold to the uh, normal Auger decay. So uh, we, we have this general overview of uh, um, cations. But let's see, in the anion channel, which kind of extra information we can derive. So, basically, we could measure the yield of two anions, H minus and O minus. So, in general, which are the channels which can produce, which can produce anions? We can have anion production starting from H2O uh, it neutral excited, which means uh, if we start from photoexcitation or photoionization in core water, it means we can reach a valence state by radiative decay. Or we can have uh, an ion production from H2O plus after resonant Auger decay. And we can even have a negative ion production from H2O2 plus or 3 plus which means above threshold in the normal Auger channel. So, uh, which kind of information we can deduce from these two anion yields that we can measure? The first information is that there is no OH minus, or let's say OH minus is below detection limit under our experimental condition. Now, if you look at all these series, OH minus can be produced only by radiative decay because you can only produce it in the ion pair OH minus plus H plus, which means that basically for um, core excited or core ionized water, the, radiation, the radiative decay is really a minor channel. Now, of course, uh, you can uh, have the same information from other sources, but this is one of the points that you can stress if you look at the anions. And then, uh, what about O minus? O minus, which is this yield here, can be produced uh, both by radiative decay, but have said the radiative decay is not important, or from resonant Auger, if you produce a singly charged uh, valence H2O. And then, if you look at this yield here, you can see it's uh, quite intense below threshold because it corresponds to resonant OG decay. It goes to zero at threshold because it's not produced for a normal OG decay. And then there's this bump. And this bump is exactly the resonance I was describing before. This bump is the double excited state. And from this double excited state, as I have already shown, we can have the resonant OG decay. We also have ultra fast fragmentation in this particular case. But this O minus yield, it's important to uh, characterize doubly excited states uh, above threshold. And last, H minus. Now, H minus, I mean, while O H minus and O minus are not so easy to produce, H minus you can produce for any of these uh, pathways. So you can produce it by radiative decay, resonant Auger, you can even produce it by normal Auger. In fact, if you look at the yield of H minus, while the yield of O minus drops across the threshold, the yield of H minus stays basically constant because there are so many ways to produce it that we can have it during the normal Auger decay in, in this way. So this is uh, the basic story for um, negative ion yield. Okay, I continue. Fifth light source, which is Soleil. And the beamline is Galaxy, which is the tender X-ray beamline. 
and again uh, discuss a photo emission experiment with a hemispheric analyzer. And in this case, I will uh, discuss double cohort states in water. Now, uh, I will just briefly, briefly touch this uh, subject because Mark Simon, in his talk this afternoon, will talk much more about double cohorts. And, but just to uh, remind you what we are talking about, double cohorts historically were produced in two ways single photon multiple ionization, so you can have the emission of two uh, core electrons at the same time by absorption of one photon. And this was a very weak process, like uh, five order, five, three to five order magnitude less intense than single core hole production. And so it was possible to detect these two photoelectrons by coincident measurements, uh, basically with a magnetic bottle, like coincidence of the two photoelectrons and one or two OJ electrons. The other way was few photon multiple ionization, so uh, subsequent absorption of two photon and ejection of two uh, core photoelectrons. But this required a very short interval between the absorption of the two photons because it's necessary to beat the OJ decay. So this was performed basically at free electron laser sources and mainly at LCLS. But in Paris, we uh, have a highly performance uh, beam line, and then we, uh, we are able to perform single channel measurement to characterize double cohorts, which means uh, the identification of states of the type K minus 2 V, which means two cohorts and one excited electron. We can call them super shakeups. Normal shakeups have a core ionization and a valence valence excitation. In this case, we have core ionization and core valence excitation. And they're very similar to shakeups because you can um, also uh, describe them with the direct and conjugate channel. Uh, I mean, we are, I don't spend much time on this because it's uh, known, it's normal shakeup language. But this means that the spectra that you can measure are extremely complicated. So I will just give this example of water. You see, uh, you can think of this photoelectron spectra like photoabsorption spectra in the presence of a core hole, because we have the core hole and a long series of core valence excitations. So these are experimental and calculated spectra. So you see all these zoo of excitation above, uh, below threshold, but this is the um, assignment, and also above trash, so you have this very, very complicated structure with all these possible multiple excited states. So uh, really it's a, a spectroscopy which is rich of information because you can characterize a very long series of excitation. Okay, so I have talked about five light sorts. Let's go to the last one. The last one is the European XFL. And so this is the area view with DAISY, the accelerator tunnel, and the experimental hall in Schönefeld. We have been working on SQS. SQS is the small quantum system uh, facility dedicated to atomic molecular cluster physics. There are some parameters for SQS, like the uh, uh, photon energy range up to three kilo electron volts. The pulse duration, this is very important, it's about 10 to uh, 25 femtoseconds. And there are uh, several end stations which can be used on SQS. We use the REMI, the, the Coltrims end station, uh, implemented and installed by the Frankfurt Group. And so, what we were looking at interaction with intense x-rays, so processes like multiple photoionization and multiple OJ decay. So, uh, in general, if you look at multiphoron absorption in photoemission, you can characterize uh, some processes like photoelectron, OJ, photoelectron, OJ, or photoelectron, photoelectron with the direct creation of double cohort if the photon absorption is very fast, and so on and so forth, so you can characterize highly excited and highly ionized state, and really a huge number of different states. And we performed the measurement on water. And for, uh, this is the calculated for electrospectrum. 
for photon energy of one kilo electron volts, you can really strip the molecule of all 10 electrons. You can really beat this poor molecule to a pulp. And so uh, the uh, states that you can characterize are for the mission, a sequence like for the mission, for the mission of J, for the mission, double cohol, longer sequences, and so on and so forth. So it's calculated at the end that for this photon energy, you can remove all 10 electrons. So the experimental parameters we use the relatively high pulse energy, so the pulse duration, it's a maximum is about 25 femtoseconds, for an energy one kilovolts, and we measured uh, three samples, H2O, D2O, and HDO, and we measure triple ion, ion, ion coincidence, so H plus or D plus, O, N plus, H plus or D plus, and we can go, we could go up to N equal eight, which means remove all 10 electrons. So this is a brief summary of the kind of calculations which were performed. Basically, is the X molecule toolkit from the CFL group in, in Hamburg. Okay, so this is the first paper we uh, published out of this experiment. If you wonder why it looks like a nuclear physics paper with 65 others, is because we had what was called, it is called a community proposal, meaning that anyone who was interested in the field could participate. So this is the um, resulting list of other. So, uh, as I said, we uh, could, could measure uh, many, many triple ion, ion, ion coincidence, but in this paper and in the following discussion, uh, I will concentrate on one particular aspect, which is the uh, dynamics of the H2O doubly charged. So, uh, the philosophy of the experiment is the following. We start with water in ground state. We have this uh, light pulse, and at some time, T equal one, we have photoionization and OJ decay, and then we produce a doubly charged species. And then, at time equal two, we have the second photoionization and the second OJ decay. We arrive at a quadruply charged species. So the interesting point here is the evolution of the doubly charged species in between the absorption of the two photons. This doubly charged species is very important, not only in gas phase, but also in any kind of liquid environment because it's always the result of uh, absorption of X-rays from uh, water. So, uh, you can consider this type of experiment like an effective pump probe experiment. We uh, cannot control the uh, time interval between T1 and T2, but if we choose a suitable parameter, we can follow the evolution as a function of the distance between the absorption of the two photons, and we can consider the second photon, uh, which creates the quadruple charge pieces, like the snapshot of what happens in between the absorption of the two photons. So, which are the experimental and theoretical results? We measured um, neuron diagrams, so in, in this geometry, so the momentum of the O doubly charged species is along here. And so, what you can see here is that uh, these red dots here mark what would be the uh, momentum value for the H plus species in case of pure Coulomb explosion, uh, meaning that the quadruply charged species is reached uh, very fast, and then we have just the Coulomb explosion with the production of these three ions. But you can see that uh, we, we have some high intensity here, but there is a long tail in this uh, momentum distribution of the uh, H plus ions. And this means that there is some molecular deformation, some kind of uh, um, evolution, which takes place between the absorption of two photons because we don't have just this uh, Coulomb explosion. So uh, how can we uh, fo better follow this kind of uh, molecular deformation? One way is to use, uh, as I said, to use 
this uh, uh, double, this uh, two photon absorption in some uh, pseudo uh, pump probe um, way, we, we had to choose a suitable parameter to follow the evolution because we cannot change the distance between T1 and T2 like one would do in a regular pump probe. So the parameter that we choose is kinetic energy release. So these are, again, Newton diagram, but sliced with respect to the kinetic energy release. So we have high, medium, and low kinetic energy release for experimental and theoretical plots. And you can see immediately, for high kinetic energy release, this Newton plot really approaches the situation of pure Coulomb explosion, because high kinetic energy release means uh, uh, fast uh, uh, process and means basically that the absorption of the two photons is uh, uh, very, it's very rapid. So the two photons are absorbed almost uh, uh, for, uh, very, very close to each other. And the situation for this intermediate and low kinetic energy release, you can see this tail, which is, as I said, is the signature of uh, a system evolution between, in between the absorption of the two photons is higher and higher. And then uh, to keep characterizing the system, we have plot the momenta in um, a different way, what we, we call scatter plots. And here, oh, okay, this is uh, position space and this is momentum space. So here we plot the angles of this, uh, the two protons uh, uh, versus the, um, the, the momentum of the two protons versus the direction of the momentum of the oxygen. And so we have experimental, theoretical, and this uh, theoretical plot with this point marked at the, when the second photon arrives. So you can see the maximum intensity is along here, which in momentum space correspond to a ground state geometry in position space, which means that a um, large number of events take place in uh, ground state geometry, which really means the Coulomb explosion. But you see, along this diagonal, we have a lot of intensity, and in this case, the angles of the two momenta uh, the sum it's about 180 degrees, which means that we can have uh, <coughs> one angle opening and we can reach even a geometry of 100 uh, with the bond angle, uh, the, the linear geometry. So one of the uh, molecular deformation effects is this uh, bond angle opening, which can go to over, over bending. And the other effect, here we have the momenta of the two protons plotted against each other. And this diagonal, uh, again, experiment theory and theory uh, with the arrival of the second photon. And here along the diagonal, we have the points where the, uh, two, fo the two protons' momenta are correlated. So the two protons are emitted at the same, uh, with the same uh, uh, momentum. But there are a lot of scatter plots where these two momenta are not equal which means that the uh, bond elongation of the two OH bond is not the same. The limit uh, is uh, sequential fragmentation. So one bond can really rupture uh, before the arrival of the second photon. So what we uh, see, the, the kind of molecular deformation that we can characterize with this experiment is um, unbending, so reaching of uh, linear geometry, and uh, sequential fragmentation, or at least uh, different bond elongation for the two OH bonds. Uh, some more uh, theory here. Here, as a function of the distance T2 minus T1, we plot uh, this uh, bond angle and the difference in the bond distance for the two uh, hydrogen. So you see, for uh, T1 minus T2, very short we have this ground state bond angle, and then we have an opening of the bond angle. So these two points here correspond to these um, sketches here. And also for the uh, bond distance, if this uh, T2 minus T1 is very short, this difference in bond distance is zero, and then progressively in close, uh, this difference increases as a function of uh, delay time between T1 and T2. And uh, another consideration is this diagram here. I said at the beginning that we can have sequences like uh, photonization OJ, photonization OJ, PA, PA, or we can have sequences like 
for the organization for the organization OJOJ, which is PPPP, AA. And here in red are the theoretical points corresponding to this sequence as a function of this uh, um, delay. And again, you can see that this PPAA sequences it can exist only for a very short time delay between T1 and T2, because again, as I said, we had to beat the uh, Auger decay. So, what happens for higher, char higher charges? So these are the Newton diagrams for O4 plus and 6 plus, and you see that these diagrams go in the direction of uh, Coulomb explosion because uh, to create these higher charges, we have to have uh, multi multiple photon absorption. So the distance between the absorption of the first two photons is very short. And same considerations for this, uh, the angle, uh, the number of points along the diagonal decreases as a function of charge because the effect is lower. And same for the uh, uncorrelated uh, protons here. So, in general, of course, the, the trend is that for higher charges, this molecular deformation uh, gets less and less important. So, we can say in water that both unbending and two-body fragmentation are significant dynamical features. And this is important not only for gas phase water, but it's important also for liquid environment. If you think of this unbending motion, in that case, the uh, oxygen momentum is uh, close to zero, which means that could increase the reactivity in uh, liquid phase and go to the production of more and more radicals. And so we think that these results are important in the um, framework of radiation damage, not only for water, isolated water, but in any kind of aqueous environment. Okay, so my last topic, I said, uh, yes, I said we have measured this, the water isotopologues, H2O, D2O, and HDO, so we can uh, look for um, isotopic effect in this general framework. So this is a paper which is going through some mail of some journal, so it's not published yet, and the experimental condition, the light source and experimental condition are exactly the same. So, let's see uh, which are the Newton plots for H2O, D2O, and HDO, and which are the uh, significant changes. Okay, so these are, uh, these are uh, for, for total kinetic energy release, they are not sliced. So this is what I showed before for um, H2, H2O. For D2O, you see the uh, most evident difference beside the value of the absolute, uh, the absolute value of the momenta which depends on the mass, you see that this tail is reduced. The tail is reduced because uh, the interval between the absorption of the two photons is fixed by the light source, so we cannot change it, which means that in the same interval, the possibility for molecular deformation for D2O is slower just because of the mass. So it, the process is just slower for D2O, and this reflects in the importance of the tail in the Newton diagram. And for HDO, the situation is uh, different. Of course, it's asymmetric because of the mass of the two light particles. But what is mostly visible is that this tail, which, as I said, is the signature for molecular deformation, is much more important for H plus than D plus, which means uh, the OH bond has much, time, much more time to stretch, and D plus is mostly produced by the uh, absorption of the second photon in a Coulomb explosion. What about the uh, scatter plots? H2O, D2O, and HDO. So for D2O, the situation is relatively similar for H2O. Maybe there is some less intensity along this diagonal because, as I said, this diagonal represents the unbending motion, and this unbending motion is slower in the case of D2O. But uh, let's say the situation is probably more interesting for HDO. Again, this spot here is they uh, correspond to the uh, ground state uh, Coulomb explosion. 
and this is more irregular because of course the two angles in momentum space are different. But what we see here is that along this diagonal is not symmetric, but we have these points which correspond to uh, molecular deformation here, which means, uh, let's say, in uh, uh, um, asymptotic situation of uh, uh, linear, uh, reaching linear geometry and having uh, subsequent fragmentation, we have that the OH bond ruptures first, then we have the H fragment which moves away, and then we have the Coulomb explosion for the OD fragment, which means that O2 uh, plus and D plus move back to back, while uh, uh, O2 plus and H plus move in the same direction. So the angles that we see here represent in the limit case a uh, collinear motion for uh, O2 plus and H plus, and back to back uh, explosion for D plus. Okay, those are the um, momenta versus momenta scatter plots. And you see, if you compare H2O and D2O, the effect is a little lower for D2O, again, for the uh, reasons they have already described. For H2O, we have the, for these points which are uh, for the uncorrelated particles, we have that in average the momenta for the uh, D plus are much higher than the momenta for the H plus, which again means that we have uh, uh, that the asymptotic limit is like subsequent fragmentation and Coulomb explosion for the OD fragment with high momentum release for D plus. Okay, so uh, we see a series of isotopic effects. But along this series, it's also possible to have the same effect. Yeah, of course it is, because there are some effects which depend on the difference of mass, which I have shown. But some effects which just depend on the electronic structure. And the electronic structure is the same. So, for instance, if we compare the relative weight of this PAPA or PPAA sequences in H2O and D2O, they are the same, because the electronic structure is the same the uh, core whole lifetime is the same, so the effect is the same. Okay, the uh, last point I want to touch is the so-called native frame analysis. So what is the native frame analysis? It's a method recently developed, which is important if we have uh, two-step processes. Like in this case, that will be uh, first in HDO, First fragmentation, the OH bond, and then fragmentation of the OD bond. The native frame analysis is based on this principle. The uh, final momenta for the ions which I produce at, at the end are a combination <coughs> of the momentum acquired in the first step and the momentum acquired in the second step. So uh, by using some equations and uh, momentum conservation rules, you can uh, sort of subtract the effect of the first step and plot the momenta of the ion uh, uh, which are acquired in the second step. So we change the reference frame and we uh, can uh, select one particular step in the sequence that we see uh, in the um, Newton diagrams. So for instance, for this case, HDO, here this plot is different from the Newton diagram because the, mo the momenta of D plus and O2 plus are the momenta corresponding to the second step. And the direction here is the direction of the H2 plus fragment, which is supposed to uh, leave first. So, uh, does it work in this case? The native frame analysis works very well if you can really separate the two fragmentation steps. Because if you can really do that, the appearance of the native frame um, uh, diagram is like um, a circle because the, uh, the fragment, if you think of the H plus leaving and then the OD fragment being really isolated, this can freely rotate. So this native frame diagram would be relatively simple. But in this case, it's really complicated because you see the, the, there is some hint of a circle, but not. Uh, complete, and then we have uh, areas with high kinetic energy, low kinetic energy, which means we have several processes at the same time. So here we have um, theoretical calculation for 
three of these possible processes. So pure Coulomb explosion, situation in which we have fragmentation and then subsequent photoionization of the neutral oxygen. And in this case, which would be uh, really the, the second step. So you can see that the uh, theoretical and experimental native frame diagram is kind of a superposition of this effect, which means that in this case, if there is a pure um, two-step fragmentation, the contribution is minor. Now, if you are familiar with the literature, you will say, yes, but there are papers with, with the native frame analysis which do show that there is this two-step fragmentation. It's true, but these papers are based on single photon absorption and uh, doubly charged uh, uh, wa uh, water with valence ionization, which means if you do a single photon measurements, there is no timing. So you, you don't know how long this... Uh, real two-step process will take. So in our case, we can say that we don't really separate these two steps because this sequential fragmentation takes time. And we have only 25 seconds, uh, femtoseconds at our disposal, and this is not enough. Okay, I guess. Um, so what we learn in HDO, that this bond angle opening exists, that the system evolves, uh, the asymptotic evolution is collinear emission for O2 o plus and H plus and back to back for the other fragment. And this two body fragmentation, which is described in the literature, takes time and we don't have enough time to actually visualize it. Okay, so I guess I'm at the end of my talk. And for the acknowledgement, uh, I have shown for the, uh, all the papers that I have discussed, so I have shown for all of them the list of others, uh, just some more acknowledgement for the uh, European XFL experiment. So uh, the main players here are the SBMR group, particularly Renaud Guillemin, the SQS team, particularly Michael Mayer, the Frankfurt team, in particular Till, who's here. And for the calculations, it's Robin Santra's group at CFL in Hamburg, and in particular, Ludger in Hester. And I thank you for your attention. And happy 4th of July for the American colleagues. OK, thank you very much. OK, now I open to the discussion and the question or comments. We have 10 minutes. Okay, so. Uh, I, I enjoyed the, the tour through, through time of, of the different um, things you could learn, but, but what's left? Um, so so these, these XAFEL light sources have advanced, and now you can create arbitrary pulse distances. You were just stochastically sampling the, the, the time between two absorption events, but you could control that now, right? Or you can use two colors. Is there anything that you feel is missing or anything that you... G give us a chance to do an experiment in water um, and we'll include you in the paper, you know? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, we have another, as you know, we have another water story which will be described by Mark this afternoon, so we can do a um, double core hole, uh, like subsequent to photon absorption, core excitation and core ionization. And, uh, well, at XFL, uh, okay, we, we could, go, of course, we would go to some less, I mean, shorter pulses. I mean, the real interesting point that, I mean, I cannot discuss because it's not my field, is if you get to attosecond region, what can you extract in water that we don't know yet? So I think this is a thing to discuss, yeah. Okay, okay, or not. Uh, just following uh, John Bozak, uh, and also I saw your very nice measurements uh, with the Dennis Lindo with this negative ions, yes. and I think they show such a different behavior with, with these uh, resonances, and uh, also some information that's not um, you cannot find with the positive guys, right? So my I wonder. Uh, uh, it, it may not be possible now, but uh, could you do these experiments with the uh, XVL 
but looking also for negative ions at some point. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, I, yes, I mean, it, it, I, I'm, as I said, I'm not aware of anybody who's planning to do that, but that, that would be certainly, I mean, to add the time and information to both positive and negative ion yield, that, that, that would be certainly very interesting. I mean, yes, uh, as you said, for this particular example, I, I was discussing only water. We use this um, negative ion basically mostly to um, characterize above threshold resonances because somebody who's, uh, I mean, old enough, maybe remembers the controversy about the assignment of shape resonances. And I, I, I was one of the nasty guys in, in, this, in this. And the negative ion yield was very important to characterize above threshold resonances because if you have a shape resonance, you have a normal OJ decay, and the production of negative ions there is very little. But if you have double excited state, like I showed in water, you have really a peak in the uh, negative ion yield. So we use it basically for that. Yeah. Okay, Hi, Alexander. Thank you, Maria. For the single ionization, also the Dennis Lindel work and uh, ILS work, right? I mean, we know that the 4A1 is the anti-symmetric vibration, the 2B2, the symmetric stretch, and the 2B1, the, the bent motion in a way. And th that seems to reflect also on the fragments, uh, how these potential surfaces cross. Now, for the double core states, um, where you directly ionize on the FAL, in a simple-minded way, this is Z plus one, Z plus two, it's doubly ionized neon, if you so want to go. Is there any geometric argument? Is there a selective excitation of modes, as in the single photon absorption? Or is there no selectivities? Do you just hit it so hard and it's only cooler explosion, plus some unstructured motions, or is there a selectivity in this? Well, uh, I guess this is a very good question. It may be uh, by the cold trim, the triple ion, ion coincidence, it maybe it's not the ultimate technique to answer the, this kind of question, but uh, of course it would be a very important thing. I mean, concerning to this 4A1, 2B1, and 2B2, I mean, 4A1 is dissociative, so there, there is basically no vibrational structure. But this 2B2 resonance, what I showed is that there is vibrational structure because mm -hmm. we can actually produce this H2 plus, plus fragment. Mm -hmm. And there, to produce that, you should have both excitation of uh, uh, bending mode and uh, symmetric structure exactly. mode. Yes. That, yes, that is very true. beautiful. And so your back-to-back, -back, I mean, the fact that the, you have this planarization in the FAL, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't that, is this just that the two protons want to get away from each other because they are positive and say, let's just go out of the room back-to-back? -back? Or is it also a mixing of the symmetric bond elongation and the bending motion, or, or yes. is this really no yes, indication? Yes, I will, I will go for this. So you would go the same argumentation yes. there? Yes. yes. Very interesting. So. Thank you. Okay. Any other comment? Question? Oh, okay. Jinghua. Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I just want to ask uh, something you haven't done, and, and just look uh, if it's a multi-model uh, way of doing, especially for FEL experiment these days, to combine with IR, or if you could have some silent channel which you don't see that in O'Shea channel, will be photon channel will see that? Uh, okay, <laughs> the, the, this is possible that there is, uh, yeah some um, uh, dark corner in uh, the, the, what, we, what we see, yeah, I, I agree with that, yes. Yeah, because I, I think in, in theory, some calculation show in the opposite extra absorption and mm -hmm. the silent channel, which uh, yes. particularly in theory cannot see in the Oshia channel, but maybe combine with, say, I'm doing rigs, you know, people yes. are doing some rigs. Say, <laughs> yes, yes, this, 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 this is a different approach, of course, yes.
Thank you. Okay. We have a few minutes. No. You measure the A to S. Sorry. A to S. No, we uh, we haven't. Oh, um, you yeah, you uh, didn't yes. compare we, we result on the, 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 water. That would be a good thing to do. Yes. Okay. What is uh, your next project <laughs> on water? Uh, well, Mark will show a <laughs> recent experiment that we have done at SQS. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Time is almost up. Okay. Let's thank the Maria Novera again. <laughs> no announcement? Just a coffee break. Là, il est sur son petit nuage, ça y est, il est sur son petit nuage. Super, super. Allez, tu es très droit. Oui, oui, oui.